You are listening to AVFC Extra, a no-nonsense look at the club we all love. Brought to you by the Claret and Blue podcast. Hello and welcome to the first episode of AVFC Extra. Today we're going to be giving you a rundown on football analytics and football stats, what certain phrases mean, how they can be used, how the football industry uses them. Um, There's a bit of a, a precursor to future episodes that you need to know what football stats are before we start rattling off um, abbreviations and all kind of things on you. So I'm Dan Rowenson. I'm joined by my good colleague James Rushton. James, how are you, mate? Well, good. I uh, can't wait. Yeah, it's like a little... You know, it's like a little start course, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. Gonna, you have to have a start. Like, give me some garlic bread, ciabatta, bruschetta, <laughs> and, so, and then start moving on past the dish, man. So this is the garlic bread of football podcasts. Which, yeah, uh, it's a light every, carb. Everyone likes garlic bread, so that's a good start. There's a few things we want to go through in terms of football analytics and football stats. Um, consider this kind of a, a glossary of yeah. of of um the words that you see pop up on match of the day even match of the day are talking about xg these days so what what is it and what does it mean um where do you want to start james what's the what's the most obvious we've got to start with start the big with? one we? we've got to start with xg because it's uh, probably the easiest to explain but it's the one that has the most meaning and a lot of people are you a lot of people are using it it's hit, it has hit the mainstream big time even though it's been about seven eight years since it came about but it is a it is a way to to measure uh, striking performance and goals and goals are the most important thing in football no one can like football's nothing without goals as I mean people say it's nothing without fans goals ain't scored I don't care how can we measure them can we uh, are more some goals more equal than others or some shots I should say are more equal than others so we'll have to drill down into that and kind of give it a rundown so I think the best way to do that is what is your understanding of XG Dan? Obviously Newcastle and Tottenham played yesterday and yeah. there was talk of XG in that game because Tottenham absolutely battered Newcastle, but were only one up, one nil up at half time, and then eventually drew one all. And everyone was saying, "Well, Newcastle, that's a smashing grab." Is a cliche for that game, isn't it? And the XG for that was that Tottenham were way ahead than Newcastle. So my understanding of XG is it calculates how likely it is for your team is going to score. Yeah, it's sort of. It's like if you take a shot from the penalty spot. Surely that's worth something more than a shot from the halfway line. Even though a shot from the halfway line might, you know, we've got Conor Harahan, he's, he's capable of scoring from long range. Stan Petrov? Yeah, Stan Petrov as well. I'm sure he'd have massively overperformed. If players are taking shots from outside the box, they're uh, less likely to go in there. Oh, that, that's just a crystal clear rule. There might be some players who were gold dust from striking outside the box. You know, Ruben Neves is one. But um, when you're striking from in the face of goal, that's more likely to score, right? There's no question. XG is a measure of how likely a shot is to score based on mo- certain expected goals models that calculate over thousands and thousands of shots what type of shots are the most likely to score. So obviously, if there's no goalkeeper in the goal and you're tapping in from you know millimeters out, that is a there, there's a higher value. Even though it's not there's no clear cut perfect goal. There's no one. You don't you don't get one XG per shot. You know, you get a percentage of eighty nine percent, which is drilled down to a decimal point, which you yeah. can then use to calculate things. So you're not going to get like a one XG for for tapping in off the line because you know some strikers do fall over. But you know, you, you're more likely to score if you're you're tapping in, which might be you know zero point seven five. A penalty is around zero point seven. It's not perfect, but it's the closest you get. And the further away you go, um, or the the different angles you take are a lower percentage. So if you're if you score a goal from a corner. That's going to be like 0.01 chance yeah. of, of scoring. So, you know, higher XG per match would, uh, you know, tell tell you that one team has had better chances than the other team. To to pull it really basically, you shouldn't be making conclusions off that. But to pull it really basically, you can say, look, this this team had 12 shots and all of them for the penalty spot. Their their XG value is going to be higher than another team. Or who's t- who's took. 20 shots from the halfway line. Picking a random game from last year, Villa versus West Ham. If at half time they said Villa's XG is 2 and West Ham's is 0.1, does that translate to saying that Villa should be 2 0 up? It doesn't really work like that because, you know, West Ham could have scored from miles off and they could be 2 0 up. It, it doesn't, you can't really come to these kind of conclusions because the way you should be using stats is trends. Like over a timeline to say things are working out, things might not be working out. You know, Watford in the Championship could play Manchester United in a FA Cup quarter final. It's a one off match. Watford could have, you know, 0.1 XG and Man United could have 7 XG. Watford win 1 0. It's a cup final. They go out. There's nothing to be drawn from that. Or you can 
be, be drawn for that. Perhaps Watford were lucky. Doesn't matter because they're through in the cup. It, it doesn't matter at all. Um, what I'm looking for really is, you know, if you're underperforming your expected goals every match, there's there could be a cause for concern because you know you go to things like Reading in the Championship who underperformed under the Yapstam. They were a kick away from the Premier League, so it didn't matter. They were a kick away in that player final from a pre- the Premier League. The next season, they collapse. It was predicted because they weren't performing to, to to a standard level. They were underperforming. That underperformance carried on. It's like Newcastle last season. We actually had an excellent question about this, and I don't know if we can we can dig it up, Dan. Yeah, so we did a Facebook Live the other day, and uh, we got a comment from Richard Laws, who said, stats aren't everything, though. Newcastle were 20th for goals expected and 18th for goals conceded, but they ended up finishing 13th. So how do you explain that? <laughs> it's a level of underperformance, like the the Reading example. You know, it, it didn't really matter at the end of that season because they achieved their goal of staying up and by some margin. But you know, what you're looking for again is that long term trend. Are uh, Newcastle going to continue underperforming and getting results? Can they can they possibly wing it like that? For no disrespect intended, but can they wing it for another season? Can uh, can they rely on last minute handballs all season long? And I don't think if you have to think rationally, which we which we're trying to do when we, we we're looking at long term things, they can't. That, that's they're not going to get handballs against them every match. That's just not how football works. Because if we did, we'll be looking to kick the ball at the hand and try and try and score something that way. But you know, you you look at a certain level of underperformance. Some teams, yeah, can break a model. They can underperform and consistently, you know, overachieve. But, you know, you look, you look at the the underperformance of XG, that more often than not heralds that this season might be bad for, might be bad for Newcastle unless they can, you know, find a, a solution to any goal scoring problems they may have, um, creating better chances. And from what we've seen so far, that doesn't look like the case. They look like they're pretty settled with doing pretty much what they were doing last season, which is, you know, buy a few big players, buy a few big names, put them in the team, play two banks of four and hope for the best, which, you know, it, it isn't always going to work like that. Can you flip that and have the opposite way then? Can can a team be overperforming in terms of XG, but be lower down the table. And how do you, what do you put that down to? Is that just bad luck? I think the best way of explaining that it, it is form, it is luck, and it is good finishing. Sometimes you can be like Stoke City are an amazing example of last season in a championship under Nathan Jones. You, you know, the XG table had them fourth. This is what Brentford, who kind of, I, I guess you could say, pioneered this stuff. Brentford used an internal justice table where they judge the performance of um, managers based on the XG and expected points, which is another thing we'll come on to. But they can say, what did the table reflect a fair was it fair on us was it yeah. fair on our performances will we do better next season if we just carry on they use that to measure internally and i think um that's a good way of looking at it because stoke like last season they were predicted to finish around fourth they were performing like they should be finishing fourth but we both know that wasn't the case they were they were well done they were, they were you know fighting relegation to like the last few games of the season so it does come down to things like that you can just have a very bad year or a very good year it can, you know we we follow football because it's a fluid game bad luck bad form bad finishing injuries all these things do take account which is why we can't just use stats like some people may want to use and again it's that criticism like in the question we had you can't come down always to stats some things are just you throw it up you throw all these clubs up into the universe and mad things come out just to kind of wrap up on on xg then there's two ways of isn't there? There's uh, team XG and player XG. So yeah. What's the difference there? If you have, say, Ollie Watkins contributing the most shots, he'll have a certain amount of that team value. You might have Conor yeah. Harahan taking. It's it's the the combined amount of your team's efforts on goal and the value of them, um, whether they're close to goal for where the chances of scoring um, per player per shot taken will add up to you know a, a team value. So that all of Ollie Watkins shots, all of Jack Grealish shots, Harahan shots, will combine to make that team value whereas the players individual efforts will be assigned to them solely so if ollie watkins has three shots on target and scores two his individual xg rating would be higher rather than the team as a collective if the rest of the team fluffed all their chances it depends because it doesn't it, it's more so measuring the shots so if someone did fluff, fluff all their chances and they were from the penalty spot they'll have a really high xg value whereas right, Harahan no, wants yeah. to wear a hat trick from outside the box and it'd be worth like literally nothing so it's less about the end result that it went in or not and more so about the quality of the chance that because it was yeah. from two yards out, it's a higher expectancy that you'd have scored than scoring from four yards. Yeah, it's not about the, the end result but how we measure the, the chances of getting that end result, if you know what I mean. Next up then is expected assists, which is obviously much along the same lines but for assists instead of goals, pretty much, right? So expected assists is the likelihood that a pass is the assist and it's based on where 
the location of that pass is finished. So it can be a bit more complicated, but it is the likely. Where does that pass put a player? Is Are you passing from the halfway line to just in front of the centre circle and that's taking a shot from there? Or are you yeah. passing into a really dangerous area? If I try and think of an example, if Tara Mings pings a ball up from the, his own 18-yard box and Ollie Watkins runs onto it and scores, how does that look in terms of expected assists because he, he just pinged it from nowhere he wasn't aiming to put Ollie, Ollie Watkins through it just kind of happened would that be a lower ranking rather than Jack Grealish threading through a pass on the edge of the penalty box passer can't control what happens to the ball when it hits that yeah. area like say Ollie Watkins is through on goal and he fluffs his chance but it's a big chance that's got a higher expected assist than you know like the, the typical Tom Carroll assist which is sideways foot into Gareth Bale who smashes it in from 40 yards out that you know you can't control what happens after all you can control is the area you're passing to so Jack Grealish threading foot threading through balls into the penalty spot is going to have a higher chance of an expected it's going to have a higher expected assist value than say a sideways pass from a full back to a centre back who then th- thinks I might fancy this because the goalkeeper's out and chips in from the halfway line you know it's, it's an unrealistic situation yeah. that's what we have so Conor Haran um, with corners through free kicks through open play through balls into dangerous areas is likely going to have a higher expected assist value and say a goalkeeper like, who's just pinging it out and it's hitting someone and they might be taking a chance and going on but that expected assist value is kind of it just comes off the back of XG is the ball played into a dangerous area and what's happened it doesn't really matter what happens to it after how what is the chance of that ball then being scored off the back of that good pass if a good pass a good through ball to the penalty area can have a higher expected assist value than say again a side pass that results in a long shot so it just comes off the back of that block quite perfectly you often see key passes and chances created often with Jack Grealish obviously the highest English uh, midfielder was it last year the most yeah. most chances created for an English midfielder what what classes as a chance created does a goal have to come from it does a shot on target have to come from it how do we define that Opta define this as a it's a final pass before a goal so it does lead into expected assists but expected assists is more like a numerical measure of how good it was rather than what actually happened if you yeah. pass that through ball to Ollie Watkins and he has a shooting chance Regardless of what happens, it's going to be measured as a chance created because he took a chance on goal and yeah. it's resulted in, you know, it's, it's a key chance on goal because it's in the box. The stuff like that, it's it's more so just a single digit rather than drilling down into the decimal. How, how good was it? Did it result in a key chance? That's all it cares about. Because you, you could say, well, Jack Grealish is putting in so many key balls and making chances and that puts him high up on Villa's rankings of chances created and for English midfielders in the Premier League. But if the striker doesn't score the goal... Jack Grealish, Jack Grealish's assist Doesn't tally really looks good. low then, yeah. but he's still creating chances. So that's why there's a difference. Yeah, because look, you look at Kevin De Bruyne, he's going to have a massive amount of chances created and also a massive amount of assists because there's better quality forwards and better quality players available to him. Yeah. Whereas I think with, with Grealish, you're going to have more chances and lower assists because the quality of player isn't the same. He might be putting, he might be making those chances, but Villa, a, a general, would be a poorer team than a tabletop like Liverpool or Manchester City. So that's where that kind of you can measure how the quality of a player could a chance yeah. created rather than maybe just looking purely on assists. I don't like assists as a a measure because, like, kind of if you go back to kind of Harahan as a set piece taker or even Douglas Luiz John McGinn. If they're putting in the quality ball, or even another team, Everton, Lucas Dean. If you're getting him and he's putting in like a quality ball off a free kick. And it hits Richarlison on the heel and then bounces to someone. Richarlison gets the assist. So is there such thing as a, as a like a pre-assist? Yeah, like this the the ball before the assist. Is that a thing? Yeah, like and, but that that's not so if you're using Because surely most, you wouldn't be ever be able to track that. You couldn't say, well, Jack Grace only got six assists, but he got twenty pre-assists because he played the ball into someone else. There are ways. I think you need to cut this bit because this is gonna go into something that is just like well over. Are we in a minefield here? Yeah, we're going to get into a minefield because it's. This is when you get into definitions, like def, like different sites that track stats of different definitions of like what a pre-assist is or XG build-up. Are you how, how involved are you in? Are you in a chain at least to a great assist? There's different. There are values assigned to this, but it depends on what model you use and whether it recognises such. So yeah. it, it can be like genuinely a bit of a minefield. So. I think we, we, we will leave that out for this episode because this is definitely something that needs an entire episode of someone going over. What we're mainly looking at is chances created and assists, which can be kind of unfair. It, you know, Jack Reed is going to obviously create a lot more chances at Villa, yeah. but he's not going to get the assists necessarily. 
hopefully he does this season because Ollie Watkins will be banging him in. Fingers crossed. Yeah, 30 um, goals, Ollie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I'll take 15. <laughs> um, I want to ask about goalkeepers. Okay. Obviously, you've got XG forward players and chances created for midfielders, even defenders. What what stats do we use to track how good a, def- uh, a goalkeeper is it like expected saves or, or what? There are there are so, there is a few measures. Like I think a lot of people in the kind of early days were using expected goals to measure how good a keeper was, what's the level of expected goals against them that turns into saves. But right. I feel like the one good one is post shot expected goals. If expected goals is a quality of a chat the area where the chance is taken, post shot expected goals is the quality of the shot itself. Salah might be taking a shot. You know, most Salah from Liverpool might be taking a shot from, you know, twenty five yards out. Where's that shot going? Is it going into the top corner? Is it going into the goal? How, you know, it's it, it measures the quality of the shot once it's taken. Where is it going? Because I don't, no one cares about a shot that's taken if it's going into the stands. You know, we care about goals. Is it going top corner, bottom left, bottom right? That measures the chance, the, the quality of the shot from when it's taken. A shot that's going into the top corner is going to have a much better value of scoring than a shot straight in the centre where a goalkeeper yeah. stood. So it measures that rather than the area where the shot's taken. So it is something you can use to measure the goalkeeper. The, goalkeeper's performance if they're keeping a lot of if, if they're like out overperforming that post shot expected goals which I think uh, Emiliano Martinez was last season it probably stands to reason that they are doing a good job of goalkeeping where, whereas you know if you've got maybe I don't want to put him on the spot here but all your Nyland Pepe Reina um Jed Steer or Tom Heaton in a poorer team, better shots have been taken against them by better players, resulting in a, a more quite a better quality of shot from a better area. They're gonna have a tough time. Like they're not gonna they're not gonna be able to, whereas you know, a keeper who's performing above those levels might have a bit better better chance of saving them. What about defenders then? Because often you'll see, you know, little tables come up on graphics with Sky Sports and BBC when they're talking about a defender and they'll talk about clean sheets, blocks and clearances. If a player has got a high a high amount of blocks and clearances can uh, can that be a sole judge that they're a good defender or does it just mean they're playing in a team that is having a constant onslaught and that's why there's more because they're having to defend more we still it's it's like goalkeepers we're still really in my mind in the infancy of kind of assessing defenders because what do you have to go on tackles is, is tackle a good measure of assessing a defender i feel like if you're having to make tackles Again, it's like you're you're in trouble. It's it's hard for me because blocks is great. Tyroming is Tyroming's reads the play great. He's great at blocking shots, but that's because Villa are under trouble. I mean, in a different team, he's gonna not have, probably have that problem if he's probably playing at Liverpool and you put him in that Van Dijk mold. What you know is how you'd assess him there would be. You be you have to be in the club and have that that adv- really advanced positional data available yeah. to you because, in my mind, an elite defender is someone who's defending space and can let their team push up the pitch and go, right, I'll deal with three people. If three, you want to run that maybe three people, I'll, I'll cover them all. I'll cover them all off, don't worry. Whereas if you're kind of more of a poorer defender, you wouldn't be able to handle anything that's thrown at you. So I feel like it is pretty tough. In my mind, I think we, this is a learning experience. We've got, we're going to have to go through it and uh, find ways to measure defenders better than blocks and clearances and interceptions because those things, um, that th- th- they're... they're affected massively by how good the team is in general. I mean, Villa are going to have a lot more shots against them and more, thus more defensive actions than a, a really good team. But we can tell that Virgil van Dijk is a elite defender. Also, you could say, well, let's judge him on when he's got the ball at his feet and things like that. But if, if again, if the team doesn't play in a way where the defenders are on the ball and it always goes out to a fullback or it goes long from a goalkeeper, their, their touches per game or, you know, their their pass completion rate or whatever for centre back might be low, but that's just because the team isn't playing that style, not that they're bad at it. Going to Mings, like I'd rather he have high numbers than that when he's playing for Villa because it's very obvious what's happening. He's yeah. stopping a lot of a lot of problems for Villa. He's fighting fires effectively last season. So well, actually, think- Villa finished seventeenth, and Tara Mings' blocks and clearances numbers are low but he played every yeah. game, you would think, well, he's rubbish then because he isn't doing his job. Yeah, it's not like I'd assess his performance solely on that, but you, yeah. you, you have made, you, you, there is a very good point in there that because Villa were defensively busy, I'd rather Tyra Mings be busier and that really reflected because that means yeah. he's doing something and he's doing it effectively rather than, say, us having some kind of unquantifiable unquantifiable and intangible that's just hanging around that we're, we're not aware of. So again, the mainstream defensive stats 
aren't quite there yet there, there's a lot of good stuff that I, you know i need to read into but for me historically it's always been easier to assess a striker because it's just a result it's a results driven thing where defensive it's a lot of feeling isn't there in defensive there's a lot of i wouldn't say emotion but like how do you how would you measure it it's like i wouldn't even know if you asked me that i wouldn't even know the first thing podcast series over <laughs> <laughs> but talk a little bit more generally then you mentioned game states earlier and you wanted to segue in after ex- expected goals yeah we've, we've rattled on for 20 minutes since then uh what is a game state james there's a lot of things that happen in football right uh, as i'm saying the obvious here but there's loads of things that happen in football and there's loads of calamity that happens in football i think a really good way of assessing game states in general is to go back to villa versus bournemouth last year um one of our first games of the season at villa park after the match everyone looked at an expected goals map and said villa should have wasn't that easy what the hell happened and i'll tell you what happened is villa dropped the ball in the first two minutes and bournemouth did their, the entire job they needed to do all match within yeah. the first five minutes score two goals it's likely you're gonna win a game to be fair isn't it like i know a lot of people say most dangerous score score line in football if you score two goals like chances are you're gonna win the match really if you if you were to play out every single game ever you're more likely to win with two goals that's why villa had more expected goals because all Bournemouth had needed to do was just control the game, control the temper of the game, just let Villa just chuck the k- kitchen sink at them. Yeah. If it was a more equal match, you know, it'd be a more equal thing. There's, there's, you know, the game state wasn't the same. It's a lot of things like momentum, um, a red card. There's all stuff that change changes the game state. And I want to bring on a guest actually to speak about this more in depth than I am because I've been taught a lot, a lot about this myself. So it is something that's very hard to measure but it's something we need to think about when we're assessing a game's performance so a game state can be affected by an action during the game then that nil nil is a different game state it would be if Bournemouth score it's one nil to them and that's a different game state managers will react differently that's a a place where you look to change things tactically because the game state is different at nil nil than it is at one nil yeah look football's all about risks isn't it like you don't attack unless you're committing bodies forward so you can't always attack unless you're an elite team because yeah. you haven't got an elite defender to cover all of that space. Like this, a lot of people say when you're, you're the most common things you'll hear when you know you're watching a match in well you know when we go out to the stadiums or you're watching in a pub is attack 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 like you can't just attack all game. It's like you go to um, Villa versus Sheffield United just a few few weeks ago, the opening match of our season, right? Um, you have a situation where someone's sent off almost immediately which has changed the entire game Sheffield United put nine people behind the ball you tell me how you break that down because I don't know like you've got you, there is some element of luck in breaking down a team that is just has no other option but to hope for a counter-attack and then bring so many bodies back to cover so much space they can't just attack what their their game then their game plan then it is to defend space so you know, it's very hard for a team like Aston Villa to come into the opening game of the season, not have that balance where they can gun forward on the counter. So they can take advantage of like an overextension and gun forward on the counter. I've suddenly got a situation they probably weren't planning for. Was that they were up against, you know, 10 men from 11 minutes onwards. So stuff like that changes the game state. Villa were always going to look better than Sheffield United because Sheffield United lost a key player very early on. Yeah, I think this is a perfect kind of example to highlight the heat of the moment podcasts and more analytical stuff, the Sheffield United game, that, yeah, you look back at it and think, well, yeah, obviously 80 minutes against nine men sitting back is going to be difficult. But I'll come on here straight after the game and think, oh, I'm frustrated, I wanted more, why why aren't Villa (laughs) winning that game? But in the heat of the moment, you just think, yeah, I know it's 10 men, but forget that, you've still got 80 minutes. Whereas you look at it with a bit more analysis and a bit more time and you think, well, yeah, it changes the whole whole state of the game. Sheffield United set up in a different way after that and that's why it was so difficult. That's not Villa being bad, it's just that they were playing a different game than they expected to. After 10 minutes, the whole game changed. When people use one level of analysis and aren't paying that any attention, it's like uh, my friend Alex Carson, that brought up that example about the Bournemouth game changed my mind about it completely because I was going on there and looking at the expected goals and saying how did Villa not win that and there's a very good reason Villa didn't win it because they the entire game was settled in and done and dusted within five minutes it was done like yeah. it, there was, it's very hard for you to expect the team to hit the ground running in the Premier League and be performing as they should from the get-go it's harder to expect them to get into a game which they've given away within two minutes two goals again you put you play that result out 
time and time again, the team with two goals in five minutes is probably more than likely going to win it. A couple of other ones that you'd noted down that you wanted to go over. Um, PPG. Now, I do know what this one stands for, and I've got a basic understanding of it. Uh, points per game, but you might as well rattle off a description for me. PPG is uh, a big phrase that kind of came into the vocabulary. It's very simple. It's very easy. It's like how many points are you picking up a game. I feel like you hear like the cliches... Um, quite often like uh two point if you pick up two points a game you're going to be promoted from a championship no problem stuff like that yeah um so it was how many you know, points have you picked up per game if you were to pe- pair off the two figures so the, you know 38 games a season how many points would you have earned i think was the the thing going around during lockdown and when they were going to finish the season because yeah. they were, had a game in hand um so one fewer in, in they obviously had fewer points than most teams because they were pretty bad but they also had one less game. So that measure kind of reflected them on them a little bit unfairly. I yeah. know there was a few workarounds, but um, it's just how many points you're picking up per game if you were to divide one number, you know, your points by games. So again, it goes back to those cliches, two points a game, you're a good team. If you're picking up a few of them, one points a game, you're a bad team, stuff like that. It's a, it's a, it's a very simple statistic. I think it's very fun, it's fun sometimes to kind of, look at stages of the season like if you were to look at uh, three weeks time and kind of see Villa's points per game you could like make some kind of prediction yeah I was going to say yeah, how, that. how could you use it points per game is it as simple as going so an example last year for Villa pre and post lockdown obviously Villa improved post lockdown and that's what that's what we um, that's what we needed to stay up we, we got points in those last four games everyone knows what happened but Villa were drastically better after lockdown than they were before so could you work out their points per game score pre-lockdown, their points per game score post-lockdown, and use that to make any kind of educated guess to say if Villa performed like they did post-lockdown in the 2020-21 season, they would average a points per game of X amount, and that should yeah. be enough to stay up? Yeah, you could just go over that 10-game span, work out the points that Villa got in the amount of games available, and just times it by 38, and then you'll get like some imaginary figure that you've just Should made. Should we do that for fun? <laughs> you've got a point against Sheffield United, so that's one. Lost to Chelsea, nil. Newcastle, so that's two points. Lost to Wolves and Liverpool, Man United. We beat Palace, that's five points. Drew yeah. to Everton, six points. Beat Arsenal, nine right. points. Drew to West Ham, ten points. Okay, right. So we've got ten points in ten games, which, which is, is a, a lovely round number <laughs> of a point per game. Excellent <laughs> yeah. knowledge. Don't need to calculate it for that. And over which, the course over. of a 38 game season, will be 38 points for Villa, which would probably would, see them safe. Yeah, that's sound. Like, but <laughs> the issue you have then is the, the game states and point yeah, and no, the, the goals. Everything comes in. State, it's not as easy to say, that, is it? Yeah. Like if Jack Grealish got injured, and I'm not j- touch wood, I didn't. Um, that affects Villa massively, so you can't just say this, apply that to that. But it is a fun way of working out. I think if you wanted to make a quick and simple point without thinking any deeper, you could say that, like you, and you, you'd be valid in saying that. But if you then to actually do some analysis, it's a bit harder to kind of make that prediction without, you know, taking expected goals into account and looking at a, a, a longer term performance. We only had, what is it, 11 games in lockdown? Or was it 10? 10. I'm just looking now. We got 25 points from 28 games pre lockdown, which is a points per game average of 0.89. So over a 38 game season, that would be 33 points, which is pretty much what we were on track for. We made that improvement post lockdown. Obviously, that's what kept us up, but it shows that on average, if you were trying to put, like you said, a very basic look on it, if Villa didn't change and continued their form from the 25th game. Uh, the 28th game to the 38th game, they would only have got enough points to be relegated. Yeah, points per game, it's it's a tougher measure because, not that it's hard to think of, but it's like, what is the meaning of it? What does it mean? Because after the fact, it, it means relatively little to me now. It's like, I don't care now. Yeah. I, like, it's happened. What's happened has happened. We can't change that. Be more so, what, what are the questions I want wouldn't inv- involve points per game, really. I'd be looking at what was the difference between Villa's pre and post lockdown performance what changed to make them yeah. thus find a high level performance which increased their points per game points per game is it's all right but it's effectively a, re- a result isn't it it's yeah, not what, really a statistic that tells you anything except what actually happened yeah it's like 
what 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 are we on pace for really that's yeah. that's all it is and that pace can change because things happen <laughs> like think that's the the rule general rule is that things will happen that will change it for the better or for the worse well yeah because as it stands villa are on course for three points per game we've beat sheffield united so three <laughs> yeah. points per game over the course of a 38 season would want to see, see us win the premier league so at this yeah, point it's, 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 it's too early to even use it as a an analysis of going well it could mean this for villa this season there's other measures you might want to use instead um but i feel like if you're to do everything, put all the groundwork in, lay out a few different things, you could make a fairly decent prediction. But then again, I'd be worried because things change quite frequently in football. All it takes is a broken leg, a few red cards, a uh, major sacking, uh, even elsewhere to change. It's like, like like a little ripple through it all, isn't it? Something happens and it changes everything. I'll just um, check down notes that we made earlier and you'd written expected points down as one you'd want it to cover. Is that not the same as points per game? No, because expected points. Um, so, so if it's based off obviously expected goals, expected assists, expected points, it's the points that you're expected to get from the quality of the game you've played. So it'll be using, in a way, the expected goals per match between teams to see what team would have likely won, and thus giving them a value of what they've earned from that match, if that makes any sense at all. Break it down for me. I think this is the most confusing one yet. Newcastle last season had 17 expected points. That was expected. The performance they put in would have likely delivered 17 points. Now, this is not a a, a perfect measure. It's not like we can use it for a great deal of things, but we over the long term, I guess we can assess performances over at Newcastle last season. The performances they put in, expected point seventeenth. They finished twelfth and got thirty-one points in the end, which is a you know massive above that. Um, that's because the quality of chances per game would have not likely won them any games against who they were facing, but the actual result they got, but it was enough to enable them to win. Again, yeah. it goes back to the expected goals conversation we had. Newcastle were making poor chances and having a lot of high quality chances against them. What actually happened though is they finished well above the relegation zone, didn't have to worry about it. This season they might have to worry about it, but we can only say that after the fact, right? We can, we can make the prediction now that Newcastle will underperform um, and that, that will be they'll be very poor based on what happened last season. But again, thing, things happen that change that and things other, other teams' performances need to be taken into that. So respected point is one team's facing off against another. One team makes more chances, the other team doesn't. One team is more likely to win that match, thus they get ex- assigned a higher expected points value for that match rather than the other team. Over a 38-game yeah. season, you've got kind of a measure of how well that team should have performed. It goes back to Brentford's justice table. How much expected points did they get per season and was that above their expectations? Thus, they've met target realistically. They might have been... They might have ended up 10th, 15th, uh, but if the yeah. performances were nailed on to be fourth, they might be looking at it and thinking, we'll do the same thing next year and we'll, we'll track on. Again, like XG in a single game, I wouldn't be saying who deserved to win, but if you're looking at um, stuff like Newcastle and Villa, they performed poorly last season. They got um, um, poor expected points values. Um, one team reflected the reality, which was Villa. They were kind of scrambling around the bottom, whereas one team overperformed and was Newcastle. Um, I'd be happier as a Villa fan heading into this new season because I think there is room for improvement that the team acknowledges that there's room for improvement yeah. Newcastle might be playing very similar to how they did last season thus they may be on course for bad news interesting I think we've covered pretty much most of the common common ones there I think off the top of my head crossed off all the ones that we noted down earlier um, and, and given you a, a pretty basic look at the definitions uh, just to end this first episode I want to ask how how we use these stats what's the point of using them because you know when you watch a game and you lose and you think oh we didn't deserve to lose that and you've got that feeling of what I've seen as a fan watching the 90 minutes with my bare eyes and I felt like we deserved to do better but if the stats don't back that up which is correct there my footballing opinion or the stats I don't know because you kind of got to fence it right you got to see, you, you can't come to any direct and always correct conclusions in football you shouldn't be able to because it is a fluid game it's not like baseball where one person stands still the other person throws a ball at them and there's different chances that you can calculate and thus simulate entire you know probabilities of what's happening it's a fluid game where 
the world's worst player for one instance in football, it is possible for them to look the best player on the world, <laughs> depending on the look available. So, you know, you could be the world's worst player in terms of ball control. Get the ball at your feet, set off across the entire pitch, do everyone over and score a goal. That's that's the magic of football. There is teams playing off against each other in the FA Cup, right? One of them might win against a massive team and get through to the next round. That you know, these things often happen in football, and they don't often happen in other sports. But which is why people are so attracted to football in its fluid nature. It's a fun sport to watch sometimes, um, but it's also can be. You can predict a few things, but in terms of predicting entire seasons, uh, uh, you know, predicting who's going to go down is hard. It's genuinely hard to do to predict who's going to get relegated per season. Yeah. You know, you, it's very easy to say the teams that come up will get relegated. Villa and Sheffield United did, and in the in the former's case, they surprised a lot of people. There's surprises in football. I don't think we should be using stats to say people are wrong. We shouldn't be using football knowledge to say people are right. We should be looking in between and kind of having nice conversations about it. I mean, I don't want to sit here with expected goals and say a striker's crap. There might be reasons why, why, why that's happening. They might be carrying an injury, might be playing in a poor team. There might be every shot they put on target <laughs> might have been saved by a very good goalkeeper. But I just want to not come to a conclusion, but ask more questions. <laughs> That's, yeah. a, that's what it's about it's just asking more questions and you're probably never going to find the answers you want all the time because if, if you did well if Brentford had found all the questions that have, that have been promoted by now uh, there's another question here from Craig he asks how important are stats when it comes to transfer targets I suppose this is maybe internally what the club would look at rather than us looking as fans Do, yeah. would, the, would the club look at endless you know, reams and reams of stats and make a decision based on that or do, is it a case of you have to go and watch the players and decide decide with your own eye? You have to use both. Um, I feel like you could make a very good transfer without even watching the player play. Would I feel comfortable with that? Probably not. You know, you, you do want a certain level of football knowledge to get assigned to watching a player. There are certain teams that will not watch a player in person but they will watch it via video. Which is, you know, that that works for me. If they're making a clear picture, I feel like Rob McKenzie did it a lot at um, Leicester before, but and eventually now he's at now he's at Villa. But the, the game there was to find players that weren't, you know, undervalued, yeah. undervalued markets like Riyad Mahrez playing in what the the French second division. They could see he was overperforming. That gives them then the evidence to say to the, the, the recruitment team, you should watch this player. Yeah. That's it. It's just com- combine it, make it work, combine, like put them together. Like you might look at a, a lad playing in the Turkish under 17s and he's twice as tall as everyone else. He's, the guy the guy's going to look magnificent in that league. He's bullying everyone. When it comes to professional league, he's not going to replicate it. So there's certain measures you can use. And I think stats, is it's a good safety tool in terms of transfers. It's not a be-all and end-all because as you see with Villa, they might place a certain preference in using statistics uh, in terms of hiring players. That might get them amazing players. Are they going to fit them into the team well? <laughs> no. And th- thus, thus it's rendered all work useless. doesn't mean stats are useless. It means the terms, u- the team's use of them was useless. Is possession percentage a meaningless stat? Is there a better way of judging how valuable play each team makes of their time on the ball? It's a good question. <sighs> that is a loaded question. You, look, you just look at possession and if you've got 60%, you think, oh, we, we've had most of the ball, so we should have done better there. Again, quality of possession, I guess, is the word. If it's just you kicking it around your defenders because you can't break down the opposition, it doesn't matter, does it? You're not really getting anywhere. You could, yeah, you could have you 90% could, and do nothing with it. You could break on the, counter-attack, on the counter-attack with very little possession and win the game. So is there much use of looking at the possession stat? If I'm looking at possession, I want to be watching matches um, before... In- coming to any conclusions I think it's easier for people to say um, teams had more possession and then they they did more with it I feel like that's that's a a really false conclusion to come to because possession can be quite I I feel like it is quite a a useless stat it's not like it doesn't have any meaning but I don't I, I haven't ever since I've wanted to learn more about stats I've placed much less importance in it than any other stat yeah like honestly I feel like there are teams that are set up to deal without possession and I feel like Villa are kind of trying to get there they want to play against the high line they want to use pace they've bought players specifically for finishing ability and pace you know you Bertrand Torre he, Dean Smith said it himself you've got the pace to beat the line Ollie Watkins got the pace to beat the line possession 
is meaningless there. I think when Sky show possession in the, the thirds of the pitch, in your own third, in the middle, and in, in the attacking third, there's more value in that because if you've had the ball in the attacking third, you would yeah. assume you're going to create better chances because you've got a ball in a more dangerous area rather than just a standard possession stat. Could be that most of it is in your own third and you're passing it around the back doing nothing. It's like you said earlier, pos- possession and shots on target is very different to... I mean, I don't know whether there needs to be this kind of... Almost a breakdown of possession in those thirds would be more useful on, on websites and stuff like that. Um, and XG is more important than shots on target. Because if all the yeah. possession was in your own half and the five shots on target were from 40 yards out, on the base of it, if you didn't know those uh, specifics, you'd think, oh, they look decent there. They've had the ball and they've, had, they've, had, they've challenged the goalkeeper. But in reality, if the possession was all in your, in your own third and the XG was low because you were shooting from far out that shows a poor game then finding a measure that drills a little bit deeper into it like shots and target without expected goals as you mentioned for possession we can look at it in different areas I'll be more happy with more possession in the, the other team's penalty area rather than my penalty area I wouldn't want my team playing around the back for 80% of the time again yeah it comes back down to we're, we're finding new measures to assess things it doesn't mean that always right, but it means we can build arguments out of it and we can create interesting, even further interesting questions. We can ask, what's the point? What, why are Villa succeeding without possession? Then we could drill down into what's been mentioned by the manager in terms of transfers, what type of player they want, how they're playing, what type of passes they're using. Um, we could just ask more questions and that's all, that's all we're ever going to be able to do at the moment is ask more questions. And come to We can come to certainly some good conclusions, but again, we're not. it's not going to answer everything. Every stat yeah. is not going to answer everything. It's more often than not it's going to pose more questions speaking of questions I'll end with the last one I wanted to mention from Twitter uh, from Oakley Doakley I always enjoy saying that name on the podcast he said what stats do you think are overused and underused I, I don't know I, I, I don't think any are overused no. to be honest I think we're, we're starting to see more more of it in the mainstream now underused I'd just say stats as a whole in terms of media I'm talking right now yeah. football clubs obviously have got mountains of data and stats that they'll track and like I said that's probably a topic for a whole podcast as well um, I'll say most stats are underused in the mainstream because like I said earlier possession just as a standard 60% versus 40% as an overall what does that really mean if most of it comes in your own third it's more so using stats probably too confidently sometimes I feel like people would especially younger watchers of football and because stats are so influential on things like FIFA Ultimate Team and Football Manager it can be very easy to kind of come to these like binary conclusions basically because you've, you've picked out a few stats when I you know football is very clearly not around for that it's not very it's very clearly not it's a fluid game so things do change and do happen yeah. and let's say XG means one thing it means we, we battered this team did we get the points no I'm more concerned about those points I'm more concerned about performances xg can tell us how a team's performing it can tell us if a team deserves points if it's not getting those points it may as well be chucked in the bin if a team gets relegated and it, we can we can we could just sat here all day and say but they deserve to be finished fourth dean smith was a, a a champions champions league worthy manager because of those performances did it mean anything no because villa got relegated so i feel like there's tough questions there about how we use them i think we can be too eager to cherry pick things without assessing what they actually mean I, I'm, I'm still learning about these things so i want to be very careful uh, but what i wanted this podcast to be is maybe i didn't answer everything correctly but i'd like to think that you might want to go and look at it yourself which is the main goal yeah of course like we've we've sat here for an hour or so talking about the, the basics of football statistics I hope this has piqued a little bit of interest and, and given you a little bit more understanding. You might already know all this stuff already. If you're interested in a stats podcast, you might be thinking, Christ, 20 minutes on XG. Come on, lads, I already know all about this. But we're hoping that we're going to be able to hit an audience that don't know some of the basics of football stats as well. So I think we'll wrap up there, mate, for the first episode. I've really enjoyed listening to you uh, chat on about it. It's been interesting. So like yeah. I said earlier, if we're interested in it, I hope that our passion for it comes across in the episodes and that you know other people are interested as well and we want your feedback we will talk about Aston Villa specifically from here on out now so if there's a topic you want covered or a subject that you think needs more airtime let us know in the comments down below send us a message on Twitter at Claret Blue Pod and uh, we'll put a running order for the next few weeks and, and get these episodes out there maybe yeah. every Wednesday should we try and commit to a, a certain day yeah fingers crossed we could do it i've um, got some really interesting people hopefully lined up for the, yeah. the future of this podcast it's not always it's not going to be stats 100 percent stats 100 percent of the time it's going to be a lot of different diverse subjects to be completely honest like uh, i think i wanted to do 
accessibility at stadiums and I speak to people who've been affected by maybe accessibility at Villa Park itself or Villa Park. Yeah. You know uh, how how would an away game work if you if you have to use a wheelchair to attend an away game? I went to drillings and stuff like that. What is or how do different people experience Villa in different ways? Um, player performances, game reviews, all sorts of things. So if you do have a topic, here's a t- it, now's the time. Like yeah. this is this is the place. Please give us a uh, review on iTunes if you're listening on audio or Spotify. Uh, wherever you get your podcasts. If you've been watching on YouTube, then do get involved in the comments section down below. Me and James will be there to, to chat along as well. So if you've got any questions, that's the place to reach us. And um, yeah, we'll join you here, same place, same time next week uh, on Wednesday with episode two. I think we're going to be doing Emmy Martinez next, aren't we? Don't promise anything. I might change my mind. <laughs> yeah. <All right>. Well, <laughs> mystery episode for episode two. We'll see what comes out. It'll probably um, be Martinez. Sorry. It, yeah, I think it will. <laughs> uh, but yeah, nice one, James. Thank you very much for your time, and we'll catch you all again next week. See you next week. Thank you for listening to AVFC Extra, a podcast brought to you by Claret and Blue. Please get in touch and give us your feedback. We love hearing your thoughts. We'll be back next week with another episode. But until then, up the villa. Mm-hmm.